Clover being a D is an amazing reveal and explains why we never got to directly see his death. Oda was hiding his smile. All right, we're gonna talk about Clover's name because it is some pretty wild stuff. But first, there's another thing. While we never actually saw Clover's death, we did see his final moments where the scholars were yelling that, ah, the tree of knowledge was about to fall, assumedly to crush them all to death. And Clover's final moments here are very sad. This is not a smiley D-man, which is especially noticeable now because the panel at the very top of this page is Jack Wan D. Saul being frozen to what he thought was death and he is giving the will of D smile. And so there's a theory as to why this is. Theory number the first one. Clover was not intended to be a D-Clan member and this is an Oda retcon, that is always possible. But theory number the second is that Clover didn't die this way because he wasn't open about his D. He denied his heritage and even publicly severed his connection to his brother. So he may not have received the privilege of a D smile upon death. One of the reasons why those with the will of D smile in the face of death is because they know that they're going to die with no regrets. They either already accomplished accomplished what they set out to do, or they didn't accomplish it, but they lived the way they wanted to. And Clover, he didn't really do either. And looking back on this panel of Clover, I can't help but compare it to Nefertari D. Cobra, who faced a very similar situation. After Luffy beat Crocodile on the Alabaster Tomb, it was crumbling, coming crashing down, and Cobra accepted his fate with a smile, a Will of D smile, having no regrets, knowing that Alabaster was now at least free of Crocodile. Now let's get to Clover's name, because there's a bit of a translation dispute here, one that we really need need the official to confirm. So in Japanese, the name is Kurao di Kuroba. And in response to this, the scans have decided to translate his name as this word, which is Irish. And despite how it looks, you say it more like Cleve or Clive or Clev. The different Irish dialects seem to disagree on that because we Irish are not typically known for our unity. But in case you're wondering how this connection was made, this impossible Irish word, curse my confusing Gaelic heritage, in Japanese is actually pronounced as Kurao. So the same way that Clover's name is spelt in Japanese, but it's also currently disputed because a much simpler translation would be the English word cloud. Sort of like how Goldie Roger together makes gold Roger. And so in this case, Kurao di Clover would be cloud clover. And it's not a terrible idea because our cloud, sky, dawn, freedom, etc. It all works well thematically. However, the Irish name holds some pretty extraordinary because the clev, because the clev solai, I don't know how to pronounce words. The, uh, the this thing is the sword of light that appears in many Gaelic folktales, most commonly in one of a hero on a mission to seek the one story, which is kind of like what we're doing in One Piece, not only seeking the titular One Piece, but we are seeking the missing story of the world. Now, to be fair, the Irish folk tale goes on to get a little bit weird from here because then that story turns into a tale of a dude becoming a werewolf because his wife cheated on him. Although allegedly the Sword of Light isn't involved at that point. But to bring up another mythical Irish weapon, I would like to offer the spear Gay Bulk, which I know not because of my Irish heritage, but because of Lancer from the Fate franchise. And this is a very shaky connection at this point, but just briefly consider this. The sun god Nika, in the only depiction we know of him, is carrying a sword and a spear. And how insanely appropriate would it be if that sword was the Sword of Light? And given that we've gone full Irish at that point, let's give Nika another mythical Irish weapon as well. Again, shaky connection. And all of this might be pointless speculation if the official translates his name as Clow or Cloud or something else. But Clover's a pretty damn Irish. And so I'm liking the idea of giving that theme to Professor Clover at the very least, as well as enjoying Oda's continued relentless expansion into mythology across the planet. Maybe Joy Boy's entire crew consisted of people inspired by myths. One of them being Emmet, who we've already covered, the golem of Jewish mythology. Meanwhile, Zunesha calls on Hindu cosmology with the idea that civilization is being held up on the back of elephants. Nefertari Lily could obviously be a take from Egyptian mythology and so on and so forth. But this whole Clover revelation really makes you wonder how many more hidden Ds there are. There could be a lot of them, many of them people who we've already met. People who, like Trafalgar D. Water Law, were told to keep their secrets hidden and actually did it, whereas most of the Ds we do know about are either confident or stupid enough to proudly proclaim it in public, whereas they should have been hiding them like Clover was because of the big D purge, and you know what, speaking of, this could be why Garp joined the Marines, to save his son and his grandson from this purge of the D. That's the sort of action that I think could completely redeem Garp from any wrongdoing in my mind. Despite the unfortunate ace incident, we do know that Garp values family more than he does duty, and that there is a method to him acting as one of the world government's greatest assets. He's about 20 years younger than Clover would be, so this prejudice could have extended well
well into his childhood and adulthood, and perhaps Gart made it his mission to protect those with the D in their names by proving to the world that there was nothing to fear, and in fact, a D could go on to become the planet's greatest hero, which is also why he was so obsessed with Luffy and Ace becoming Marines, to change the perception of the D name and to wash the stigma away. Although I guess the term would be to assimilate the D wielders into greater society, which I think would be an interesting take on the Will of D, and it would add a lot of tension to Garp's relationship with Dragon, who has almost single-handedly undone all of his work by becoming known as the world's worst criminal. Look, I get why she did it, but I don't think Atlas punching Lilith was entirely necessary. Mate, it was absolutely necessary. Atlas is the aspect of violence, that's just how she gets things done. And in the chapter review, I mentioned the idea that it was probably her plan to blow herself up to push the Thousand Sunny, even if Ethan wasn't there trying to be a bit of a prick. And I do think that makes sense. Atlas saw a problem to be solved, and so she came up with the most effective solution that violence could offer. Given how much Atlas resembles her, I love how Ginny sacrificed herself again for the sake of Bonnie. What a, what a depressingly sweet thing to Say. I'd honestly forgotten about this, but Atlas and Ginny do look pretty stunningly alike, especially when you compare Atlas to young child Ginny, because then it's not just the hair, which I should say that is not a common cut, something weird is definitely going on here, but the faces also start to match up quite a bit. Atlas is almost like a tribute to Ginny, which sounds a bit odd at first because Atlas is Vegapunk, Atlas should be a tribute to Vegapunk, and then you need to start asking questions like how would Vegapunk even know about Ginny, and even if he did, why this? But to answer the first one, Vegapunk did convince Kuma to participate in his memory experiment, so Vegapunk almost certainly does know about Ginny, or did because of like the whole death thing, and also knew that Kuma's most pleasant memories were when he escaped with Ginny and they lived together as children. Still, the leap is a bit weird. I, Vegapunk, am going to clone myself, and I'm going to make one of those clones Bartholomew Kuma's childhood love. It's uh, there, there's something there that doesn't quite track to me, but it might be like the failsafe that he programmed into the other pacifista. Another line of defense for Bonnie if she ever truly needed, which could be why Atlas is the aspect of violence. Someone who would not hesitate to punch fight for Bonnie's sake. Although even then, Atlas here has kind of done the wrong thing, because leaving the giant warrior pirate ship has now put both Kuma and Bonnie in danger of being killed by Sat at this very moment. And you know, this right here might be where Kuma makes his one final sacrifice, because the only thing capable of getting him to move seems to be whenever Bonnie is threatened by Saint Satin. But with Atlas, yeah, I'm not so sure. There is a definite resemblance to Ginny there. It's on purpose. I just don't have a solid why to lean on. Liam, we could really use a recap of what happened to each of the Vegapunks. What a magnificent idea. Shaka got shot, Pythagoras went boom, Stella got stabbed, Atlas also went boom, Lilith went to sleep, and as for York, this little piggy went wee 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 all the way back to Marajois to take up the full-time occupation of being the worst person ever. However, that recap is missing a certain Edison. I'm not entirely thrilled with the status of Edison at the moment because Oda has left it even more frustratingly vague than usual. The last time we saw him was collapsing against a wall in chapter 1116. And then the next update we have is York confirming that he's been cut off from punk records, thus implying his death, or at least that's York's conclusion. But going by the rules of One Piece, I think we need to assume that Edison is still alive, at least until someone flat out states that he's dead or Oda shows his death. Because just being disconnected connected from punk records isn't quite good enough for me. I would be incredibly dissatisfied if it turns out that Edison was dead, but I don't think that Oda would do that. He hasn't shied away at all from showcasing each of the Vegapunks dying in very visceral ways, so I have no reason to believe that he would off-screen Edison. And it might be the case where Edison just has that one last thing to do to screw over the world government and ensure the escape of the Straw Hats. That or he gets saved by Stussy and the CP0 members. At the moment though, it does feel like we're on track for Lilith to eventually become the world's canon Vegapunk, which is very fitting because she was the first one we met and introduced herself as Dr. Vegapunk. And it also makes sense with her namesake. Lilith was supposedly Adam's first wife who was banished from the Garden of Eden, cut off from paradise, much like how Lilith has now been banished and forcibly cut off from punk records. Still wondering what Zoro wanted from Vegapunk at the beginning of the arc. So I think I've addressed this before, but it's always worth bringing up again. I know that almost 40% of my audience read One Piece only through scanlations, and that's why questions like this keep coming up. In the scan translation of chapter 1062, Zoro says, 
hey Vegapunk, there's something I want from you, so you'd better play nice, got it? Which made it sound like Zoro had some genuine business on Egghead Island. He had a specific thing in mind that he wanted Vegapunk to do, and all sorts of theories came out of that, like say cure the smile fruit users because Zoro got very attached to the whole situation with Toko and Yasu. But if you read the official translation, this was never a question. Zoro actually says that they've got some demands, which is him using his position of seniority to negotiate with a hostile party because Lilith was originally going to open fire on them. And this is why, even if you don't like it, you should still read the official translation because yeah, it makes mistakes from time to time, but so do the scans. The scans make mistakes far more often. You just don't hear about it because no one makes a big deal about it. When the Vegapunk speech is over, can you put it together? Yes. Are we going to get Viking outfits for Elbaf? Yes. Anyone else notice that the satellites were eliminated in the reverse order they appeared in the manga? No, this, this is incorrect. This is one of those situations where people are trying to contrive genius and foreshadowing, etc. And One Piece has a lot of that, but not right here. The first Vegapunk we met was Lilith, but the second Vegapunk we met was Shaka, which already ruins the pattern because Shaka was the first Vegapunk to be killed by York, no less, who was the last Vegapunk to be introduced, and within the system should have been the first to die, but rather notably is not dead at all. Oda plans and foreshadows a lot, but not everything is some sort of mind-blowing pattern. I think it makes sense for Yamato to become the daimyo of Kuri. I kind of agree. If Yamato is genuinely following the Kozuki Yoden path to boiled glory, then it would make sense to inherit his former role as daimyo of Kuri. We'll find out pretty soon whether or not Kuri actually has a daimyo or not because it's our next stop, but I'm also still very confused about the future of Yamato. He is a bit of a realistic bomb, but One Piece is probably ending in a month from now. By which I mean a month in world time, not real world time. The days and weeks move very slowly for us, and almost everything that's happened post time skip has occurred within the space of two months. The Fishman Island arc took place in early February, Wano started in early March, and Egghead Island is now taking place in early, possibly bordering on mid April. So, whatever Yamato's doing here, there's just not a lot of time to do it, because very soon we are going to get the call to action to participate in the final war. During which time, I have no doubt that Yamato, Kinemon, and Momonosuke are going to have the honor of boarding. Thousand Sunny again, because Luffy did promise that there was space for them whenever they so chose. But yeah, just keep this in mind. Luffy will potentially be the Pirate King by the time his birthday comes around, which is May 5th. Bonnie could use her power to make the robot young again. Yeah, Bonnie could do so many things, but probably won't. I try not to be too hard on Bonnie because she is a child and won't always use her abilities in the most efficient ways, but another part of me really craves to see her full potential, which even after having used Gear 5th still seems incredibly untapped. And what I would also love to see is Emmett's reaction to Bonnie and Gear 5th, and whether or not he gets confused and thinks, hang on, she's the Joy Boy as well, because that could go a long way to answering our current Luffy questions. Would Emmett be able able to distinguish between Luffy and Bonnie if they both had the heartbeat of liberation playing within their fleshy bodily instruments. Even though she's exhausted, I think there is still one last opportunity for Bonnie to use the form, and it might be a pretty fantastic idea to do so now, considering that Saint Satin is poised and about to attack. And you know, that could be quite a nice moment. A situation where it's actually up to Bonnie to protect Kuma instead of the other way around. And with that, Kuma would know for sure that Bonnie will always be safe and finally be allowed to pass on to a hopefully much less tragedy filled world. Time traveling Luffy sounds more plausible, not gonna lie. All right, so I've always thought that this idea was really stupid, like real stupid. But then again, One Piece itself is real stupid. And oftentimes it's the weirdest ideas out there that you cannot afford to discount. It's the logical ones, the ideas that make sense that you can go, yeah, that's not gonna happen. But this is an idea that has existed for quite some time across many different incarnations. One of the very first ones I remember reading about was the idea that Luffy was Roger because of how similar they looked when Roger was young. And so that theory posited that Luffy Luffy was going to go back in time to fulfill his wish of becoming the Pirate King, essentially stating that the world has only ever and will only ever have one Pirate King, Luffy Roger. But a lot has changed since then. One big change being that time travel was actually confirmed to be a thing that people can do through Kozuki Toki's Devil Fruit, although that only allows people to be sent into the future, not the past. But then again, if One Piece is one big circle, then the future is the past. That is what Egghead Island is all about. And someone also pointed out to me how the giants fit that theme perfectly as well. Given that we first met them on a prehistoric island, and now they've returned to us on a future island, both time periods that are inconceivably far away from us. So time is a strong motif, at least on Egghead Island. But now the general premise of the time travel idea is that Luffy is literally Joy Boy, but doesn't know it yet, because he's going to travel back in time and set the events of the Void Century in motion. The reason why I'm not really a fan of this idea is because it would mean that Luffy's journey is going to end on a very sour note, because Joy Boy failed. So it seems a bit off to have Luffy succeed in bringing about the dawn of the 
world only to then go back and have a bad ending overall. Unless he goes back in time, fails and gets put in some sort of stasis and wakes up right before the final fight or something. I don't know, I guess it would explain a handful of things. Like how people seem to know the events of the future and can pinpoint them to an exact year. And also why Emmett seems to know Luffy or at least thinks that he knows Luffy. So look, I'll agree with the comment and say that time traveling Luffy does sound slightly more plausible now. I still have some pretty big reservations about it, but you know what, who cares what I think? I'm just a man on the internet. So I want to know what you think. Drop your thoughts on time traveling Luffy in the comments and I may or may not read them.